everybody to the CMS Colloquium. And um, as most of you probably know, but I'll, it bears repeating for those uh, guest attendees, um, that uh, the way that we run the, the colloquium is that um, we have our graduate students and some other members of the MIT community um, on screen with our guest. And um, after the presentation, there'll be a QA and a in which um, folks on screen can directly ask questions and those who are attendees off screen can uh, ask questions versus, via the Q&A bar. So, um, that is very much in, encouraged. So um, uh, tonight I am going to hand over to my colleague, Justin Reich, to introduce our guest, Joshua Littenberg Tobias. Great, thanks so much Vivek and thanks everybody for being here. Um, so we make media as a society for many purposes. We make media to entertain, we make media to persuade, we make media to inform. Um, and one of the things we do is make media to educate, um, to help people build new capacities that they didn't have before. Um, and there are lots of disciplines that can contribute um, to the study of media that educates. Um, and the learning sciences are kind of a bundle of those differences connected to psychology and cognitive science that are interested in, um, uh, particularly in sort of technology inflected ways, like how do we create media that most effectively build new capacity? Um, and so Josh and I work in a lab, the teaching systems lab, um, which is really interested in these questions of how do we help people learn better? Um, uh, Josh has specialties in measurement and evaluation. Um, there are lots of different ways to improve uh, media for education. Um, and uh, one of those ways to improve media for education is to figure out whether or not the things you're doing are working. Um, or if you, if you say that you want to create media that helps teachers do a better job with anti-racist teaching, what does that even mean? How would you figure it out whether or not your media is doing the things that you want it to do? But and you could ask the same question of if you make media, you know, that helps kids, uh, you know, learn to divide fractions or adults to be able to conjugate Spanish verbs. How do you know whether or not what you're doing is really working? How do you know whether or not it's working better than something else? So that's the that's the expertise that Josh brings to our interdisciplinary lab. Um, and we've been doing some really cool work together over the last few months um, to figure out uh, how we can help support teachers um, doing a better job with equity and teaching practices. And Josh has come up with some really innovative ways um, to help us figure out uh, how we're doing using a combination of quantitative and qualitative and computational approaches. Um, so I'm really excited to, to turn it over to Josh to let you all learn more um, about the work that he's doing with Marvez and, and many other folks in the lab. Oh, I wanted to say one other thing, which is that Josh uh, has some job uh, talks coming up for some faculty positions he's applying for. Um, and this is a bit of a practice for one of them. Um, and uh, it's actually quite an interdisciplinary audience at this other talk that he's giving. So you all should feel very free um, to be very candid in your criticism of Josh's uh, talk, both on the substance um, and on the delivery. If there's stuff that doesn't make sense or you think doesn't land well, um, it'd be very generous of you to, to let him know so he can improve uh, on those things before the before the live event coming up. So I'll turn over to you, Josh. Thanks, Justin. I uh, appreciate the introduction. Um, I just wanted to say before I jump into it that this is work that um, I, I've been really honored to be involved with and I've worked with a lot of really great uh, people at the MIT Teaching Systems Lab, um, including um, uh, Elizabeth Gorman, who was a graduate student in CMS um, uh, last year, uh, Marvez, who I worked with for a number of years, um, Chris Buttermer, who's a postdoc, and uh, many, many other people who've uh, contributed to this uh, research. And, and so a lot of what I'm doing, some of it, a lot of it, um, I couldn't have done it without the help and support and working with other people. Um, so I'm going to share my screen um, and we will, we will get started. Um, so my talk today is on measuring uh, equity promoting behaviors in digital teaching simulations. And I'm gonna talk a little bit how I used uh, topic modeling, which is a form of natural language processing to understand what's happening in the simulations. 
But before I kind of dive into the specifics of what I did, I need to give you a little bit of background about um, teaching and education to give you kind of like the 3000 foot view to sort of understand kind of what we did and why. Um, so just to kind of go over how the talk will be structured, I'll start with some background about um, the topic and sort of why we looked at the things that we did. Uh, I'll talk about uh, what are digital equity teaching simulations. There's a lot of, we, a lot of words there uh, to unpack. Uh, then I'll talk about the specific analysis that I did using something called structural topic modeling. And I'll explain a little bit about how the kind of the inside the hood, how that actually works in practice. Um, and then I'll present some results from a anal uh, analysis that I've done, worked on over the last couple of months, looking at a course that we um, administered last spring. And finally, I'll present some, some future directions about where I, I see this research going over time. Um, so to start, um, just some uh, background. Um, so many of you have heard of the term, uh, the achievement gap. Um, so this is a term that's very commonly used in education policy circles. Um, and it refers to the difference uh, in achievement uh, between white and Asian students and black and Hispanic and Native American students. Um, and so this is something that policymakers have been talking about you know, for a long time, particularly since the 1980s, and there've been all kinds of education reform efforts to close the achievement gap. Um, I know some of you may have heard of No Child Left Behind, which was under uh, the, uh, President Bush. Then there was Race to the Top with Obama in the 2010s, and then there was the Every Student Succeeds Act in 2014. So we've had all these iterations of reform. Um, but the thing is, there hasn't been a change. So if you look at this uh, graph that I'm presenting, you see that um, the achievement gap has pretty much remained constant over time since the early 90s. So with all the education reform doing, um, there hasn't actually been change in the achievement gap. Um, and, and, and particularly in the last few years, there's been um, a lot of criticism of even the term, the achievement gap. Um, there was a research that came out uh, last um, summer that actually showed that if you, you kind of frame um, uh, you show people videos about achievement gap, it tends to reinforce negative stereotypes about uh, African American students. And there is a lot of criticism about framing the achievement gap, uh, framing this thing in terms of a gap. Um, and, and, the, and the reason for this is that by talking about the gap, many people attribute that to the actual characteristics of the students themselves and not to the opportunities that students have, the experiences students have in school. And so by, by focusing on sort of the outcomes, you're ignoring all the inputs and all the experiences that students are having that lead to these uh, differences in academic achievement. Um, and so in our work, uh, we, we, we often um, uh, draw on the work of, of a scholar called, uh, named Richard Milner, who talks about this idea of the opportunity gap. Um, so in his work, he says that we really need to focus um, not just on um, like achievement outcomes, which are important. You don't want to ignore differences in outcome, but it's also really important to understand the reasons for those differences. And his work, in, in his work, he talks about all the ways that schools uh, systematically um, uh, discriminate against um, particularly Black and Latinx students um, and, and all students of color in the way that schools are structured. Who uh, do students have teachers who look like them? What are the dominant cultures within schools? How do schools rules and policies, how do they affect students? And there are many, many other ways including curriculum that is not culturally responsive um, uh, and standardized testing that doesn't capture all of students' abilities. Um, so these are all factors. In this talk, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna focus on one specific aspect of this, which is this idea of discretionary spaces in teaching. Um, and this idea comes from the work of Deborah Ball, which basically said that in teaching, teachers have a lot of things that they can't control. You know, often they can't control when school happens, they can't control, um, you know, what their classroom necessarily looks like, what type of building they're in. but Anyone who's been a teacher knows that there are a lot of decisions that teachers have to make every day and that these decisions can have um, a big impact on students' experiences. Um, and in her research, she talks about 
um, kind of really examining these discretionary spaces and understanding uh, what are the forces that affect uh, what teachers decide to do. Um, and increasingly thinking about how do these discretionary spaces either uh, perpetuate or disrupt uh, racism and, and racist structures. Um, so for example, if you a, a teacher sees a student who has their phone out, they have a number of different choices of what to do. They can just ignore it and keep on teaching. They can you know, go over to the student and say, hey, you're not supposed to your phone out. They can confiscate their phone. Um, they can send the student out uh, to the principal. And all these decisions have, um, have implications further down the line. We know um, from research that discipline in the school is connected to the uh, school to prison pipeline. Um, so even though you think, oh, this is a sort of individual like decision, all of these things accumulate and add up over time. Um, so I'm gonna kind of transition now to talking about our digital equity teaching simulations. So in these simulations, what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture practice in these discretionary spaces. And I wanted to give you some examples of what this um, looks like in practice. So this is from one of our simulations called um, Jeremy's Journal. Um, and to give you a little background on Jeremy's Journal, um, in the simulation, you play the role of a teacher who is, um, has a student named Jeremy. And Jeremy is at some times uh, very actively engaged in class and other times disengaged. He's generally very friendly and social, but sometimes struggles to kind of focus on the actual assignment that he's supposed to be doing. Um, and one day, um, he misses class um, and, you, for, and, and you don't get any reason why he missed class. And the next day he comes to class and he presents this note from his, his mom. Um, and, the, and he says, I'm sorry, I was out yesterday. I wasn't feeling great and had to go home. Um, what do you want me to do for, for makeup work? And he presents this, this note from his mom. And the thing is that the school policy, you know, is that you have to have a note from a doctor. So in this moment, what do you do? Um, response one is say, we missed you at class yesterday. Hope you're feeling better. Or response two, remember that the school policy is that you need a signed doctor's note in order to be excused from class. Um, and I was wondering if uh, I wanted to try something, but we will see how it works. I'm going to send out a poll. I only want you to answer the first question, but I want you to say, um, which of these uh, two responses would you choose? One, we missed you at class yesterday, or two, remember the school's policies that you need a signed doctor's note in order to be excused from class. So you just need to answer the, the first question. Can everyone see the poll? Uh, I see. Panelists can't vote, okay. Okay, uh, if you can't vote, can you just put um, either one or two in the chat for, for which one you would do? Okay, okay. Um, I'm seeing um, a, lot of, a lot of ones. So I think we have an agreement. Um, many people, yeah, um, I think everyone's panelists, okay. Uh, so it was good to know that, that that technology is not particularly reliable. Um, so I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of ones. So these are actual responses that people gave um, in the simulation when we, when we did this in the course. Um, so these actually represent two different ways um, that, that people can respond to the situation. Um, and what we're trying to do uh, with these scenarios is capture these individual moments of teaching and provide people with options like, what do I do? What would I do in this moment? And once you do that, give them time to reflect on why am I making the choices that I'm making? Are these choices actually, are they perpetuating um, racism or are they disrupting it? Um, and so why, why simulations? Um, so simulations have a number of affordances that make them particularly useful for talking about things uh, about teaching. Um, one of them is actually some of you might see it as a limitation, which is that in a simulation, um, 
you are representing some parts of reality, but not all of it. So a simulation by definition is not capturing everything about a real life teaching situation. Um, but in some ways it actually works to our advantage with teaching because teaching is extremely complex activity. Anyone who's ever stood in front of a class of students knows that there's a lot going on at any particular moment. And so what we're doing in our simulations is we're, we're breaking it down into simpler parts in order to focus people's attention on particular things. And so it allows you to really focus on discrete um, aspects and moves in teaching rather than having to try to kind of comprehend a large uh, situation where lots of things are happening at the same time. Um, Another thing that is particularly good about simulations is that it allows you to practice skills within a kind of simplified lower stakes setting. And this is particularly good uh, for novices who might not be um, uh, ready to take on sort of a more complicated uh, situation. It might benefit from doing things in a lower stakes, simplified environment. But even for more experienced teachers, it's often helpful to take a step back and kind of be reflective and think about, okay, um, now that I'm out of my classroom, I'm out of the student, what would I actually do in this situation and really think about it and talk about it? Um, and the final thing that is helpful with simulations is that it allows you to kind of provide opportunities for targeted reflection and feedback. And I use the term targeted here intentionally um, because one of the things we know about um, learning new skills is that it doesn't necessarily help to kind of do the same thing over and over and over again. What, what allows you to improve is this idea of deliberate practice, focusing on a specific skill set and getting feedback on that skill set. So what we're trying to do in our simulations is really be very intentional, focus on specific things and using those for opportunities for reflection and feedback in order to facilitate learning. Um, so I've kind of set up like what, like some of the background about influencing our work. I talked about why simulations. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about actual types of simulations we built. Um, so the teaching system lab has developed a platform called Teacher Moments. I know many of you are familiar with Teacher Moments either through the teaching systems lab or our EdTech design studio, or just sort of being around the CMS department. Um, but what's really cool about Teacher Moments is that it's a platform for authoring simulations. So anyone can go and build their own simulations in Teacher Moments. Um, it's free, openly licensed, people can use it however they want. And we've had more than 300 scenarios authored within Teacher Moments and have had more than 6,000 users. More and more people are using it every day. Um, so I definitely encourage you, uh, if you're interested, to check out Teacher Moments and kind of see sort of some of the features of it. I wanted to give you a flavor of what a, scenario, what a Teacher Moments scenario actually is like. Um, many times when we talk about these simulations, people assume, oh, you're doing something in VR or you're doing something um, that's sort of, you know, different from what it actually is. And so I think it's helpful uh, to actually kind of see uh, what a simulation looks like. So I'm going to play about a three minute clip um, from one of, um, from, and I'm going to share computer sound so you can hear it. So this is a clip from one of our simulations called Roster Justice. Um, and the background to this is in this simulation, you play a teacher who a few weeks before school, you get your, your class roster. Um, and you notice that the computer science class that you're supposed, that, uh, you're supposed to teach, the uh, rosters are in balance. So even though your school is 50% um, African-American and Latinx, the actual composition of the class is mostly white and Asian and male students. And so you go to the principal, Mr. Hall, who is played by uh, Justin in this scenario. And you're gonna have a conversation with him about um, your the class rosters. Thanks for coming in. Um, I wanted to talk with you about some of the scheduling changes and I also heard that you wanted to talk to me. Um, We've got someone else coming in a few minutes, uh, so why don't we cut to the chase? Why don't you lay it all out for me? Thank you, Mr. Hall, uh, for meeting with me. I know that you have a busy schedule. Um, before we talk about the scheduling changes, I just wanted to share my concerns. Uh, I looked over the rosters for computer science, and I noticed that the computer science class doesn't reflect our student population. Um, it has way more white students and male students than we have in the rest of the school. And I'm concerned that it means that our students of color and our female students are missing out on some opportunities. 
uh, to take computer science. Uh, so can we talk a little bit about how we might be able to change the schedule so more students can take computer science? Well, first I'd like to say thank you for bringing the issue to my attention. I get your concerns, really I do. Um, Unfortunately, there's not a lot that we can do. School is starting just three weeks from now. Um, what are some quick fixes that you or I or someone else could do right now this year? I don't think that there are any quick fixes. I think we need to take a broader look at how we do scheduling. Because of the way we schedule things, we ended up systematically excluding a group of students from computer science. Um, and these are students who historically haven't had opportunities to take computer science classes. So I think it's a serious problem that we need to address. I, I want to be super clear. We cannot change the schedules at this point. Um, sometimes imbalances will happen when you only offer one section of a course, like we're doing this year with Intro to CS. We're offering intro to CS during period five. I mean, it's super complicated. We're offering intro to CS in period five. We're offering algebra in period five and period one. So anyone who has intro to CS for period five just is gonna have to take algebra in period one. Um, what if I got you a teaching assistant to help with the class? I don't think it's super complicated. There are a few weeks left before school starts. We change kids' schedules all the time. And I don't think a teaching assistant solves the underlying problem. Why can't we look into changing when the math courses are scheduled so that all of our kids can have a chance to take computer science? Thanks for coming in. Um, I want um, Thanks for coming in. Uh so I um, hope you guys enjoyed uh, that, that scenario um, and appreciated having Justin play the uh, angry uh, principal. I know that um, one of the things I find, even though I've done the scenario many, many times, is every time I do it, I still feel that jolt of like, oh, I'm talking to the principal. Um, like, what's he going to think of me? Like, how can I make this argument? And I think that that kind of shows the affordances of these types of simulations, that even though I'm just talking to a video, I know that the video isn't going to actually respond in the moment. It's not a real person. I still feel that that emotion as I'm going through the scenario. And a lot of our, our simulations are like this, that even though they're not necessarily capturing all the authentic, what it would be like in the moment, there's something about it that makes it feel very authentic. And we found when we've done this with, with now thousands of people, people often say, yes, it does feel authentic. It feels like something that would actually happen in, in, in real life. Um, that's really a testament to all of the people who work to design these scenarios to be really um, impactful. Um, so last spring, um, we launched a course, course called Becoming a More Equitable Educator. And we took these uh, uh, simulations and we put them within, within the course. Um, so the way that the course was structured um, is that within each unit, um, you would sort of be introduced to a topic and then you would do a simulation about that topic. And then after you did the simulation, um, you would watch a video of other teachers. We actually went to different schools around the country, did the simulations with a teacher and filmed the debrief of uh, a debrief with them doing the simulations that included interviews with individual people talking about the decisions that they made. So even though um, it was an online course, this was obviously last March, like right when COVID was starting. Um, so many people were sort of turning uh, to online learning that time. So even though it's online, you're able to see kind of what other people are thinking and doing um, in that moment. Um, and the course itself was structured around this idea of educator mindsets. Um, and we uh, framed it around four pairs of mindsets. And the idea is that these are things, mindsets that are out of balance in um, US schools. So just to give an example, uh, one of the mindsets that we looked at is equity versus equality. So equity is that sort of everyone gets the thing that they need. And if it's some people need more things, they should get those things. And we should focus on individual need, not on giving everyone the same thing. 
Well, equality means that everyone gets the exact same thing uh, and we shouldn't give people special treatment. Now, what we argue is that it's not that equity is good and equality is bad, um, but the problem is that these mindsets are currently out of balance, that we have too much equality uh, and not enough equity uh, in schools. And what we wanna do is we wanna shift people's focus to thinking about as they make these decisions, how can I act with more of an equity mindset? Um, and so in all of our the units in the course, each of them was framed around these uh, pairs of mindsets. And there was a simulation that was attached um, to each of them. Um, so this is all kind of a setup for the research that um, we ended up doing. So um, in, the, in the course, there were 963 people who did at least one uh, simulation. Um, and there were four simulations in the course, each of them that was embedded within one of the units. Um, so it says it's difficult to read the presentation. Can everyone see my slides? Do I need to um, make it bigger? I think if you can just, if you don't mind sharing the link. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to do that. that. People can, uh, can look yeah, through. I'm happy to do that. Uh, let me... I will put it in. Thank you for that feedback. Um, okay, I'm putting the link in the chat so people can, 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 take, can take a look at it. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, I will go back to the presentation. Um, so as I was saying, we, we, we had four of these simulations embedded within the course, each within one of the units. Um, so we had a lot, a lot, a lot of text data, um, probably more text data than any person could um, look at qualitatively. Um, so I was interested in how can we use um, uh, natural language processing tools to automate some of this analysis to understand what are people doing in these simulations? Um, and so um, I looked into different ways of using natural language processing. Um, there has been a lot of research about that has used natural language processing within um, large scale data sets. Um, just to give a few examples, um, they've used it to do uh, automatic scoring of cognitive tasks, so, so machine scoring of assessments. Um, people have used it to predict people's effective states. So there was one study that, lo that looked at what are students' um, feelings about math? And they looked at people's responses within a online math curriculum and correlated that with student um, self-efficacy uh, for, for, for math. And then uh, a study that Justin actually worked on was looking at uh, uh, responses in discussion forums and trying to see um, and this was a course um, that was a political course. So do conservatives and liberals, um, how do they engage with each other within discussion forums? So there's a lot of different ways that you can use um, uh, natural language processing to make sense of, of large uh, data sets. And I was particularly interested in, can we use these tools um, with our simulation data? Can they provide us some, some information about what are people's experiences within these simulations. Um, and the particular method I used was something called structural topic modeling. Um, so a topic model is a uh, model that detects underlying patterns within large data sets by identifying latent topics within, within a uh, text uh, data set. Um, and what's nice about top of modeling is it does not require any a priori assumptions about the structure of the data. So you don't have to have labeled data in order to use top of modeling. It, it draws the topics from uh, the, the data itself. So this was particularly good because we didn't have any labeled data. So it was a particularly good for this type of data set. And we we're also interested in exploring like, what are people doing within, within the simulations. Um, we used a uh, what's called a mixture model. So this is how the, the topic model works. It basically estimates a probability of a topic appearing within a text and a word appearing within a topic. And I'll kind of give you a little illustration of how that process actually works. Um, and the particular form of topic modeling that I use is, 
is allows you to include covariates. They allow you to see associations between a topic appearing and some characteristic about uh, a person. Um, and I'll kind of kind of dive into that a little bit later and show you how that worked within our analysis. Um, so this is kind of the, the pipeline for how uh, structural topic modeling uh, works. So kind of the input is, um, is your text data. And in our case, it was sort of a big um, Excel file with each row was a different response within the simulation. So most of the simulations you saw sort of three of the ones from roster justice, all the simulations were basically kind of prompts and then people wrote in, wrote in or said their answers and we automatically transcribed those answers. So you kind of have this big, uh, you know, basically Excel file of data. And so you take that data and the first thing you do is you have to process that data. Um, and this is important because within those uh, pieces of text, there's a lot of words that are not that informative. So things, uh, conjugations like and or prepositions, uh, pronouns, like all those don't really provide you a lot of information about what's happening within the text. So the sort of general accepted role is to kind of pull those out of, 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 the, of, of, the, of the text that you're looking at. Another thing we did was stemming, which is to say like, getting rid of all of the um, conjugations. So like, um, you know, for example, explore, could be explorers, exploring, explored, exploration. We took all, it took all those and kind of made them one single word. So that way it focuses on the content and not on the particular way that it's used within a sentence. Um, another thing that we did is we separated it out by line. So I was interested in topics appearing within individual responses. And I thought that there might be multiple topics. And so a way to kind of pinpoint when a topic is occurring um, is by uh, separating it out into individual lines. And this kind of ended up giving us, you know, even more rows of data to look at. And finally, under the recommendation um, from the authors of the, of the structural topic model, I removed infrequent words. So words that didn't appear that frequently within each document took them out. And we ended up still with, you know, over a thousand different words within each simulation. And kind of what you end up with is this um, document term matrix. So it's basically like, think of like a big um, Excel file and each column is a word and each row is, is a different uh, piece of text or what's called in, in, the, uh, in the natural language processing world documents. So basically if a word appears in a document, it's coded as one. And if, it's, if, if, if it doesn't, it's coded as a zero. And this is for every single document in, in the text. And what the structural topic modeling does is it takes that really big matrix and it kind of looks for correlations between words within documents and uh, documents that are, have the same word. And it kind of spits out um, a set of topics that um, have certain words that are associated with them and, and documents that have certain topics that are associated with them. The, the challenge is that you have to specify in advance how many topics you want. So it, the topic model will spit out 60 topics, it will spit out five topics. You have to figure out kind of using some metrics, how many topics do you actually want the model to produce? And there's um, a number of different ways that you, you can do that to kind of figure out what is the right number of topics to extract? The, the larger issue is that um, the topics don't come pre-labeled. So it's not like it spits it out and says, this topic is about you know, baseball. Like you have to, to, to assign those labels yourself. Now, sometimes it's more obvious and sometimes it's less obvious. Um, those of you, if you're familiar with um, factor analysis or cluster analysis, the same issue where the, the model will kind of group your data but then you have to, as the researcher, have to figure out what does this data actually mean? Uh, so I'm gonna kind of walk you through an example of how we kind of came up with labels and this will sort of kind of show you how the topic model works. Um, so these were two topics um, that appeared in um, uh, the model that I ran for Jeremy's journal. Um, so one of them is topic seven. Um, and in this graph, the purple dot is the probability of it appearing within topic, um, topic uh, seven and the, the it was actually reversed. Um, but the, the green dot is the probability of it appearing in topic 10. Um, and so I was interested 
And this graph kind of illustrates both the probability of a word appearing in topic seven, and then the probability of it appearing in the other topic. And you can see that certain words are more likely to appear within one topic and less likely to appear in the other, within another topic. So for topic seven, the words today, yesterday, better feel are very likely to occur within that topic. While for topic 10, doctor, absence, no, mom, those ones are more likely to appear. Um, so this is kind of giving us some sense of like what is actually going on in that topic. Um, so now I'm going to give you uh, a phrase and you're gonna have to, I want you in the chat to say, which topic do you think that this piece of text come from? Is it from um, topic seven or topic 10? So just to give you a reminder, this is the, this is the words for topic seven and these are the words for topic 10. So I want, look at this um, thing and just sort of this, do you think it's a topic seven or a topic 10? I'm gonna go back to the, uh, okay, I see a lot of sevens. Um, and <laughs> you were right, the model agreed with you. It said there was a 75% probability of this, of this, of this piece of text uh, containing topic seven. Um, now let's try this one. Uh, remember the school's policy is that you need to sign doctor's note in order to be a student from class. So is this topic seven or topic 10? Just uh, write in the chat. Uh, seeing a, a lot of tens, and again, you guys are right. <laughs> uh, the model is training you, exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was a 60, the model said there was 65% probability of topic 10 appearing. Um, I should say not all of the topics were this clearly delineated between two. Sometimes it's a little more ambiguous what exactly the model is detecting. Um, but we, what we did is something kind of similar to this process where we look at what uh, documents the model said was likely to, that topic was likely to appear in, and the words that were highly associated with that topic. And kind of through that process, me and some other graduates, uh, research assistants, graduate students, we uh, came up with topics. So for topic seven, we labeled that, glad Jeremy is feeling better. And for topic 10, uh, we labeled it doctor's note uh, and school policy. And we did this for all of the topics that were extracted in all of, this, all of the simulations. Um, um, so once we extracted the topics, what we were interested in was, are these topics associated with anything? Do they, are they associated with um, participants' attitudes toward equity? And remember I said earlier that the structural topic model allowed you to include uh, predictors. So in this case, we wanted to know, um, was there a relationship between uh, what participants said on surveys in terms of their attitudes toward equity. And we had uh, surveys for each of the mindsets in, in the course. So there was a survey for equity and equality. There's a survey for deficit and asset. Um, and we wanted to see, is there association between how I responded to a survey and what topics I noticed uh, within the simulations? Um, and what was really exciting for us was that there was a pretty strong connection, that certain topics uh, you were more likely to uh, notice if you had reported on a survey more of an equality mindset. Uh, and there were certain topics that you were more likely to notice in more equity mindset. So what was interesting is that the uh, doctor's note, people who mentioned the doctor's note were much more likely to have an equality mindset, while people who asked Jeremy how they were feeling were much more likely to mention on surveys they had an equity mindset. And we found this in all of the simulations that we did, that there was association between what topics you noticed and um, your, your, your mindsets on surveys. Um, so this was exciting for us to think about, like our simulations, are these simulations actually measuring something real about what people think and believe having to do with equity? Um, but th that's sort of good for like a measurement piece, but um, people, Justin and Peter were, of course, were also interested in, did these courses actually work? Like, did people actually change in their mindsets over time? Um, so I wanted to look at, is there a way that we could use these simulations to understand, are people actually changing in their uh, mindsets over time? Um, 
The problem is that we had four different simulations. So you can't compare the topics from one simulation to the next because they were totally different simulations and totally different subjects. So the topics are not necessarily comparable. But what we could do um, is we could compare you to a set group of people. Um, so what we did is for each, um, for each simulation, I calculated the maximum probability that any topic would appear in your responses. So you kind of end up with a, with a, a table like this. So for each topic, each, each row is an individual user, and there's a probability that that topic would appear in any of the user's responses for that simulation. Um, and so this is not real data, but you can, this is sort of what it looks like. like. Some people were more likely to mention one topic, some people were more likely to mention other topics. Um, and then I was interested, okay, so we have all that data. Um, let's compare them to the people who started the course with the highest equity beliefs on the survey. So I took the top quartile or the top 25% of people on, on their pre-survey in terms of their, um, their uh, educator mindset beliefs and were they more shifted toward uh, equity or equality or asset versus deficit. So I wanted to see like, do other people in the course, do they become more similar in the topics that they're mentioning in the simulations to those group of high equity users. Um, and so I'm gonna show you an example from our first simulation. Um, well, I wanna go back and explain something. So how do you see how similar people's topics are to each other? Um, well, I use this concept called uh, Euclidean distance. Um, so uh, those of you who remember uh, 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 trigonometry, uh, you know, B squared, if, you know, the Pythagorean theorem. So this is basically like, what is the distance between one point and any other point? And I basically took each person's um, topics and looked at, okay, how similar is my responses to this other person's responses? And the closer my responses were on to their responses, the more similar um, I would say that my responses are. And so you can see in this example, like if these are like the top reference group, this person's responses is closer to uh, this person's responses. So now this is just not the, what the data really looks like. It's actually not two dimensions, it's many, many, many dimensions. But this is sort of a basic idea of what we're talking about, we're talking about distance. Um, so in Jeremy's journal, the people in the fourth, the first quartile, so with the lowest equity beliefs, were the furthest away from that reference group. Um, so their responses were the least like that top 25% um, reference group. And these percentages here, it represents sort of on average for any topic, how far my, percentage wise my response was. So it's not a huge number. It's not like, you know, 30%, 60% versus 30%, but on average there's about a 4% difference in any topic between someone in the highest group and then someone who started uh, in the lowest category. Um, and so as interesting as this is the first simulation, how did people change over the four simulations in the course? Um, and so what was really exciting for us is that um, in, in the first simulation, uh, you see that one, these other people in the first, second, and third quartile, they're all kind of further away from, um, the people in the fourth quartile. And as they progress through the course, they all get closer both to each other and to the fourth quartile. Um, so I think what this is showing is that people are becoming more uh, similar over successive simulations. And in this data, I'm only looking at people who did all four simulations in the course. So it's not that you know people are dropping off and the less equitable people are leaving. Basically, we're actually seeing people are changing to become more similar to people in that fourth quartile over the course of the course. Um, so just to summarize, uh, natural language processing tools such as structural topic modeling can help with these large uh, simulation data sets to understand what's happening in these simulations and to identify topics that are emerging. And what was really exciting for us was our, we would kind of bring these results to our designers and they would say, yeah, I actually included that that thing in that simulation on purpose. I want to see how people would respond. So it's interesting that the that the machine learning model was actually able to pick up on some of those nuances. Um, the second thing is that what you notice, what people notice and mention the simulation was associated with their beliefs and attitudes. So it's suggesting the simulation is capturing differences between people and how they respond to different types of situations. Um, and finally, that 
interesting way of evaluating learning is that we can see by comparing simulations over time, you can see how people changed in terms of their beliefs and did they become and becoming more similar, converging with one another as the course progressed. Um, I know we're, we're running short on time. I just wanted to briefly uh, talk about two future directions. Uh, one is that uh, we're going, we put in a grant to do a study where we're actually going to be doing this with teachers um, in grades three through eight in uh, five different di districts across the country. So although our MOOCs have a lot of educators, it's usually just people who kind of randomly come into the course or hear about it. So in this way, we're actually gonna go out and recruit people and we're gonna be able to link it to data about their students. Um, so we're interested to know, does your response in a simulation, is that actually predictive of student outcomes? And because right now we don't really know whether these, these behaviors are actually predictive of anything outside the simulation. So we're hoping with this study to actually understand a little bit more about how is behavior in the simulation connected to behavior outside the simulation? Ultimately, how does this affect students' experiences? Um, and then this other thing that I'm really excited about is this idea of being able to give automated formative assessment and feedback within the simulation. So I'm gonna play a short clip of what uh, roster, just, roster justice could look like in the future. Um, so this is like from the last prompt that you heard. So anyone who has intro to CS for period five just is gonna have to take algebra in period one. Um, what if I got you a teaching assistant to help with the class? Um, so now I'm, I'm writing, uh, that does sound super complicated. Uh, yes, a teaching assistant would be great. So I'm submitting it and then something pops up and says, remember that your main concern is the imbalance of classes. Does a teaching assistant solve that problem? Um, so this is actually feedback that some a facilitator would give in person. So we're, we're hoping to use um, uh, machine learning models to actually be able to detect, like when are people saying, yeah, a teaching assistant would be great to be able to give them that automated feedback. Um, this is something Marvis actually has been doing a lot of work on um, over the past few weeks. So I'm hoping that this is something that we could actually implement uh, in the near future. Um, so, so, so um, thanks again for, for listening to my talk. I'm, I'm glad I was able to come and talk to you. And I'm really excited to hear your questions and to hear kind of what, what you think about all this. Right. I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, I have one myself. Um, I, I guess I wanted to um, get a sense of, I wasn't quite um, clear on uh, when you showed the simulation the first time, yeah, um, how how that works in terms of how it's been, um, how the simulation has been built to respond to verbal responses, mm -hmm. um, is it, uh, and and what responses like pre-recorded responses mm -hmm. from the principal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is the spectrum of responses from the principal that that are going to be potentially um, chosen, uh, you know, algorithmically to respond to various responses or various inputs from the, the person who's going through the simulation? Yeah, that makes that's sense. A, that's a, a really great question. Uh, question. Uh, the short answer is that it does it now like there, there, there's no algorithm no matter what you say justin will give the same response um, in that simulation um i think there's actually two things one is that we had it when we built this we had not sort of started to develop the technology to be able to respond um in real time to have more responsive uh video um but the other thing is that often if you're having an argument with someone like what you say does like you're actually not talking to each other. You're actually like having a conversation where like you say something, the other person just sort of 
ignores what you're saying. So we've actually found with the, with the argument types of, of simulations that it actually works pretty well to have somebody have a conversation with someone who totally ignores what they're saying. Um, and the, the person who designed this also was really knowledgeable about schools and how these conversations worked. And so when she was designing, I think she, she really thought about like the types of things that a principal would, would say in that moment. Yeah, I was actually going to say that that the lack of varied responses from the principal is probably closer to reality than if you tried to create yeah. multiple responses. Yeah. I have other questions, but I want to make uh, open the floor to everyone. Um, well, I have my next question, which is um, just related to the um, uh, the the future directions that you just spoke about, um, and you were talking about um, the potential um, uh, testing in the field um, where I just remember the the number. 252. I don't know. Yeah. I don't remember if that's 252 uh, uh, teachers or or schools. Um, teachers. Teachers, right. Okay. And so I guess the question that I have there is um, if they are self-selecting mm -hmm. um, to take part in the simulations, is it, um, you know, how are you correcting for the possibility that those teachers who were open to um, to going through these simula simulations that are um, geared towards um, you know shaping or geared towards guiding people towards uh, a, a more um, equity based mind um, mindset. Mm -hmm. um, that would that be a self-selecting set of teachers who yeah. would already be sort of um, a closer to that mindset or be more willing and open to have their mindset changed through a process like this, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so I actually think what you're pointing out is a good observation about the, the course, the online course that we did um, because, you know, we, the course is, is sort of open and free and anyone can take it, but the types of people who take it are the types of people who already care about equity, issue, equity issues. So one of the challenges kind of right up front is that there wasn't a lot, there wasn't as much variation in the types of responses um, as, as we would have liked. So like even those, I would say like, you know, I said the, the low equity, the first quartile, but that first quartile probably in most schools would actually be probably like, some of the more equitable educators within that school. Um, the people who are probably like the most in need of the course are probably the least likely to be taking it. Um, I think, and one of the things that we wanna do with that study that I was proposing is, is do more active recruitment of teachers. So we're going to be working with districts to sort of identify schools uh, to participate in study will actually be like, recruiting teachers and paying them money to participate in, in this course. Um, and so I think what we're hoping is that we'll get a broader and more diverse group of teachers than the types of teachers that we got in, in, in who took the move. And hopefully we'll be able to reach teachers who wouldn't necessarily like be pursuing an online course about equity on, on, on their own. Uh, Roya, and then Tomas, was that? And yeah, okay. I was curious and sorry, I'm outside. So if you can't hear me, that's why. Um, I know that something we've thought about a lot on the project that I work on in the lab is, is sort of how we transition a shift in mindset to a shift in practice. And I would love to hear kind of your, your thoughts on that in terms of this work um, and where you see that going with kind of the implementation with teachers. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a, 
it's a measurement challenge, especially in, in a MOOC, because um, you know we get we don't know in advance who who is going to take our course, and they kind of show up, and you know it's not like we can um, like be like, okay, we're going to go to your class on this day. We actually were planning at one point to send um, Chris Buttermer, our, the postdoc who works on this project. We had a whole plan last March that he was going to like find schools and contact them and travel all around the country to do observations. Um, but then obviously COVID happened. So that's not, that, that kind of was not no longer a possibility. Um, but I think that it, it would be um, like, I'm really excited about the work that you're talking about in Inspire Man. I think it'll be really interesting to actually see kind of what 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 are teacher like if someone does something in simulation, is that related at all to 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 to, to their actual practice? Um, and is is there is there a correlation there? Um, I suspect that that there is based on like what we've seen in terms of like survey responses, but it'd be interesting to kind of actually connect that to actual practice. Tomas? Um, yeah, my question was really similar to, to Roya's, uh, but I think maybe I can frame it, frame it in a different way. Um, so um, yeah, first of all, thank you for the great presentation. It was extremely interesting and I'm really excited to, to what um, this can be done with this methodology. Um, so um, this would assume from the assumption that there is a goal to increase an equity mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, um, I mean, this is something that I can probably get behind out and behind of, but I wonder if um, if there are other possibilities to do this, like with other values, other normative values that, that mm -hmm. maybe are sourced from teachers and maybe like not from academic labs, but to see what, what the other teachers will have to say about that. And I was also wondering if, um, um, yeah, so I think this is pretty much what you just answered to Roya, Roya but I guess the, what, well, the, the conclusion from, from, from this method is that you can tell people that certain, uh, certain um, yeah, actions are associated with a certain mindset, but I wonder what's like the extra step, right? Like, um, and, I, and I guess that's what you address in the MOOC. So I was wondering if you could like discuss, yeah. discuss, discuss what the contents of that were. Yeah, um, let me know if I understand your question right. Um, are you asking like, you know, what is like, okay, we can measure these things, but how is this actually gonna change people's practice? Is that kind of similar to it? So it's two what different questions. The first one yeah. is whether you could like chime in other normative values instead mm -hmm. of equity, if you could yeah. think like, you know, if they wanna make more solidarity teachers, like what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And the second question would be to, if you could talk about the MOOC experience, like how can you turn this insights that mm -hmm. you get through this data into, into specific practices? Yeah, um, so I think the first thing is that we, we've done, so equity is sort of one area that we've worked on, but we've done it in a number of other areas, including um, um, Roya has, has done a lot of work on, on math um, instruction, uh, which is less, it's less a question of, um, and Roya, you could disagree with me if you think it's wrong, it's, it's more of a sort of teaching certain skill sets than um, a kind of normative value. Although there probably are normative values that are baked in, into those particular skills that we're trying to teach. Uh, we also, uh, Marvez and I worked on a course um, called Civic Online Reasoning, um, which was about preparing teachers to teach students how to identify misinformation online. So it's based on a method developed by a group at Stanford um, called basically to call lateral reading where you you, if you see something online, instead of like spending a long time reading through it and trying to determine is this real, is this not real, um, which is sort of the traditional way that teachers have been taught to how to teach information literacy, they say that the best thing to do is actually Google it, to Google and see like who is behind the information. Um, another important thing in that, that course is that many teachers, and many of you probably experienced this, like think that Wikipedia is bad, like basically that Wikipedia is totally unreliable as a source. Um, but we know that actually, you know, there are some issues with Wikipedia, but it can be really reliable, especially for finding sort of basic information about something. And Wikipedia also cites a lot of the sources. So you can go to those sources and look up the information. Um, so that we actually developed uh, practice-based uh, practice simulations to, um, to like have people 
kind of do these, these exercises to see how much they've learned uh, about that particular skill set. Um, and Marvis has, has, I hope this is okay, I'm plugging your work, but they, they've done this really cool uh, uh, classifier that basically detects like if response to one of these tasks and say like, okay, did you figure out that this tweet was from a parody account or, or, or not? Um, and we're hoping to use those to give people um, feedback on learning. Um, I think ultimately, so like answer to, to, to your second question. Um, so we have some data from our course um, and it's all self-reported. So, you know, take it whatever grains of salt you need to that uh, people uh, over the course uh, were more likely after the course and particularly four months afterwards to discuss um, uh, equity issues in their schools and to participate in networks around equity. Um, so there's some evidence that the course, um, after taking the course, people are more likely to engage in actions around equity um, and learning. And I would really be interested in learning more about like, what does that actually look like? And is there a relationship between taking the course and doing these things? That's actually one of the reasons why we're proposing this um, study uh, is to do a randomized experiment where we assign, randomly assign teachers to take the course and we see does that actually change their behavior. So I think it's definitely something that I'm really interested in as research and also interested in like, can stuff like a online virtual course can then actually affect behavior in the real world? Great, thank you. Uh, Ambar, and then there's a question in the, the Q and A from Will. Amber. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yes, thank you, Vivek and Joshua. I, I was wondering. So when you may like when you ask us like which option would we choose, we all chose one, right? Mm -hmm. And like like that relates to equity. But I'm I'm just wondering like even though like if teachers answer one and they are more likely to. Uh, think about equity also mm -hmm. I guess like the the school rules mm -hmm. also affect right so I mm -hmm. was wondering if you have thought about actually making simulation to change uh the way the principal thinks yeah about it rather than the like the professors because they could you know like they yeah. could think about equity equity yeah. but like you know like the rules are the rules so I'm yeah I'm sure. yeah yeah, and no, I think that's a really great point. And it's something that, you know, comes up a lot in the course is that, you know, we intentionally frame the course around um, these sort of individual moments in teaching. Um, and the reason we did that is probably because those are the easiest to change. So like I, as an individual teacher, I can like make the choice to like interact with the student differently or push for something or like bring something up with my colleagues. It's more difficult to sort of face more systemic issues. I think our theory of change um, is that like if, if people start to notice these things in their practice and they start to talk about it with other people, that kind of builds up the momentum to sort of change some of these bigger things. So like, you know, an individual person saying like, hey, actually, like, let's think about how our school's policy about the doctor tone, how does that affect you know, students who may not have health insurance or may not be able to easily get to a doctor, may not have the transportation. Like, how does this policy affecting those particular students? So I feel like, like we start with sort of the individual and that can kind of lead to some of the more systemic changes. Great, there's um, Will's question and then Emily added on to, to that question. So I'm gonna um, read these um, so that others can, can hear them, but um, feel free to follow along in the in the chat bar. Um, so Will writes, um, I'm interested in the notion of discretionary spaces in classrooms and the types of situations in which they arise. I'm curious about how you go about deciding which specific types of discretionary spaces slash scenarios to focus on in the simulations that you develop for the courses. Uh, and then uh, Emily adds, it's also interesting to think about whether or not teachers understand them as discretionary or not in particular contexts um, and would interact with changes in their interest 
in enforcing school rules, mm -hmm. which, yeah, so we. Yeah, yeah. Um, so all these scenarios um, are developed um, based on sort of real things that ha happen in schools all the time. Um, I know my, my wife uh, is, is an educator and she's always like, you know, I'm always like, oh, can I, can I use that example that you just did? But I think it's a perfect one for her teacher moments. And so I think kind of like the characteristics of a good like discretionary space is one where the, this, the answer isn't obvious. I think the one I gave you actually was a little bit more obvious than like a really good one would be, but like has some sort of tension between like, do I want to do this thing or that? Thing? Because if it was an obvious decision that everyone would, would just do that, but there has to be something kind of countervailing then um, that would make you think, well, maybe I don't want to do that. Um, one of the things at the end of the, of the, of the Jeremy's journal uh, simulation is that he asked because he's missed school and because of, you know, he asked if he can, if he can be excused from taking a quiz that you give every week. Um, and so he comes up to you and he's like, can, can I get out of this quiz? And whenever we've done this, we've gotten many, many different responses. And there isn't really a right answer. It's not like if you give him the quiz, you're like not equitable. And if you don't give him the quiz, you're equitable or vice versa. Because there, there's, you know, reasons for wanting to give him the quiz. I think what's important is like your reasoning behind it. So many people will say like, oh, I'm giving him the quiz because I want to know how he's doing. And then I'll give him feedback and we'll talk about it. And I'll understand more about like what is going on with him versus someone who's saying, oh, I, I don't want him to give him the quiz because like everyone else has to take the quiz and that's just the rule and he's got to adjust. This is the real world. Like no one's going to care about his situation at home. Um, so like the decision is not as important as the reasoning behind it. And that's actually why I think that the, the natural language processing is so important. Uh, it's because we could just construct these scenarios as like multiple choice, like do this or do that. But that doesn't kind of tell you like why, like why did you want to do this? And that's where I think some of the text analysis stuff really comes into play. It allows us to understand some of the nuances of why people pick something and not the other thing. Marvis. A uh, great presentation, Josh. Um, well, I just was wondering if you could go into a little bit more about um, like the development of the scenarios, like who are the designers and like how we plan for research, especially in the context of IES, where we're going to be doing it over um, all these districts with all these different teachers in different contexts. Yeah, um, are you saying like how do you how we design to work for different types of, of audiences? Um, yeah, I mean, I think like one of the the challenge, especially in a MOOC, is that you're doing it for a global audience. So you're doing it for people who are, um, who are um, like may not be as familiar with certain things in the US context. I think what works well is when the scenario is like a universal enough experience that many like people could identify with it. So even if the specifics are not the same, um, I know this is actually something where I thought like originally like, oh, people aren't going to get this Jeremy Sparrow scenario because it's so like specific to like US schools. But when I actually looked at the data, people, a lot of people got it, really understood what was happening there, even if they don't understand, even if like the specific details aren't important. And that's, that's where I think that the, like the characters and their arc is really where, and I guess this kind of connects to the media piece, like this is what makes the scenario meaningful and meaningful as a learning experience is if you can kind of connect to what's actually happening in, the, in, in this situation. I have another question that's, that is more, um, I guess, geared towards, um, you know, taking this opportunity um, to talk about uh, methodology, since mm -hmm. half of our students are, are taking a media research methodologies class mm -hmm. with me at the moment. So um, uh, I wanted to just ask you about um, the research design and, and sort of iterative des design-based research um, specifically in relation to uh, the natural language processing mm -hmm. and how, um, how you've built that out, um, you know, what, what are the steps when you're, um, when you're building that, what are the steps that you go through 
um, in order to fine tune um, how that works. Yeah. Um, so it was a very iterative process, I would say. Um, it wasn't something where I was like, I know exactly what I want to do, like from the beginning. Um, I had like, we had been doing these scenarios for some some time before we, we did the course. And so I had some understanding of like what the universe of possible responses were to these types of scenarios. So I knew that like there were certain patterns to like what people, how people would respond. And like there were kind of like, you could kind of like see like, oh, people respond like this way or they respond this way. Um, but all that data, you know, was sort of like a small sample. So I didn't actually know exactly how it would, how it would work when we kind of did it at a larger scale. Um, the other sort of like decision that I, I had to make, um, I hope this isn't getting too into the weeds, is like thinking about the goal with using the natural language processing. So like one approach um, could have been to say like, okay, I'm gonna like score each of these responses and like see if I can build a kind of classifier to, to predict like what are people, are people, um, you know, acting equitably or not equitably. But I kind of wanted to leave it open-ended to feel about, like, I'm not gonna like predetermine what is equitable and what is not equitable. I wanna see like based on the data, like what are people, um, what are people noticing? And what are, are the differences between people and what they notice? So that's kind of the like framework I used and why I geared, I was sort of leaning toward more um, unsupervised models that would allow, kind of allow the data to sort of like uh, generate. And then once I had it, then that was a kind of, like, as I was saying, like labeling um, is not always, um, it's a kind of a difficult process because you can kind of, you have to make a subjective decision about what the data means. And that's where I actually did a lot of conversations with the people who designed the simulations, looking at the data, talking um, with other people, getting some kind of validation by thinking about like, okay, do other people see the same things that I'm seeing? Because it is a, it's subjective, but you want it to sort of be like transferable so other people could kind of come to a similar conclusion. Um, I think that's one of the challenges with this type of analysis is that there is some like research or subjectivity and you don't want to sort of hide that behind the like objectivity of like, these are the numbers. You want to say like, this is the process that I use to kind of come to this, this conclusion. Um, but I actually, we actually did, I actually had people like, um, who weren't involved at all in the design of the model. Like I gave them like a task where they had to choose which tops, kind of like what we did in this exercise. Like I like selected a piece of text um, and then like gave them a bunch of different topics. And one of them was the one that the model said it was most associated with. Um, and so we actually could predict, like had them say like themselves, they're basically doing what the model was doing. Like, you know, which topic is most associated with this piece of text. And it actually was, we matched the, the model about 65% of the time. So it wasn't like a perfect connection. And often it was in cases where the model was kind of iffy about like what, what was actually in, in the text. Um, so I think it's like one of those cases where like the more like cases where it's more clear cut, it was easier for, for people to kind of correspond with the, with the model. And in cases where it was less clear cut, there was more ambiguity there. Just a, a, a quick follow-up is, um, it, you know, you touched on just now um, the, um, how a particular response, um, you know, might be, I think you were um, using the example of, of whether or not to give the, the student the, um, the, ta the test and mm -hmm. how there, you know, one, two teachers who decide to give the, the student that test might have different reasoning, mm -hmm. um, one of which is more aligned with equitable mindset and one is not. Mm -hmm. um, to, um, and maybe this is partly, you know, already answered, but I'm curious about how that kind of um, qualitative assessment um, is built into the overall um, project, yeah. you know, whether, um, you know, so that you can, since like you're saying, you're not predetermining um, in the model, okay. which, which kind of response corresponds to equitable mindset and which is not. Yeah. 
And yeah. so that in the, those, those kind of like fine areas or gray areas, yeah. it seems like more qualitative engagement with the subjects yeah. or with the teachers is sort of what will give you the data that you need. And so I'm yeah. curious how, you know, the, the kind of interplay between um, yeah. that kind of qualitative method um, and the kind of modeling that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I see like Justin's comment about like using unsupervised approaches to complement traditional qualitative bottom up grounded theory types of analysis. And I think that's actually a good analogy for like, how do we, you know, look at this type of data? Because, you know, in the course, it was probably, you know, over a hundred thousand rows of data. So, you know, we could have coded all that data, but I'd probably still be working on it now. Um, and what was really interesting was like, once you see, once you kind of can see what's happening in, in the data, then you can sort of start to put on some of your, 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 your qualitative lens and kind of do some more looking at like, what does this actually mean? Um, I'm sort of, my, my training is, is quantitative, but I also done some mixed method and qualitative research. And I'm, I'm sort of interested um, in kind of that, that space of like, how can we use like large data numbers, but also kind of understand like, you know, more qualitatively, like what are people thinking and how is it, you know, that you can't actually, is more difficult to capture with like a multiple choice, like survey item. So this is why like, I'm very excited about this type of methodology going forward. Great, thank you. Um, other questions? Okay. Um, well, we can, um, we're almost at, at 6.30. I, um, Rebecca, I, I have but, one last suggestion. This is Justin, yes. sorry, my house yes. is chaos, so I'm not gonna uh, impose <laughs> on the That's okay, um, that's okay. The students got a, a bit of a taste of the chaos in my, in my house at the end of the last session, so. If we have just a couple minutes, if folks have any sort of either substantive or stylistic suggestions for Josh, thinking forward ahead to his next presentation, if there are parts of the presentation um, where he lost you or became uninteresting or problematic, or even parts that like really connected with you and engaged you, I'm sure any of that feedback would yeah, be super helpful yeah. as he thinks yeah. about the, you know, and you're, Vivek, you've seen lots of these kinds of talks too. So if there are thoughts that you had, I think that would be really, really welcome and valuable. Josh, who's going to be your audience? I'm sorry? Who's going to be your audience for your talk? Um, so this is, um, it's a, at Northeastern, it's um, the, it's their College of Art and Media Design and also Applied Psychology. So there are new people who are more sort of like media design folks. And there are also new people who are more kind of like working in schools um, as educational psychologists. And so it's sort of, Actually, I think this is a, is a good representation of the diversity. So the people who are like, you know, may not know that much about education, but know a lot about design and people who know a lot about education, but might not know that much about design. Um, they're also um, part of, and that's why I spend actually more time than I would normally, is they're interested in someone to teach statistical methods. And so I wanted to also showcase some of my own ability to explain it's just old concepts um, in, in a more lay audience um, type of way. From the standpoint of someone like who was like definitely on the media and arts and, yeah. and nice things, I don't have numbers. Um, I gotta say at some point uh, you lost me with the technical stuff, but mm -hmm. so okay. I would consider okay. framing it like as more, more look at the story that you're telling mm -hmm. and not just start from the methods because yeah. okay. um, that might be awesome. Yeah. No, that's helpful. Yeah. Something that was difficult for me was when you were asking us like to choose between seven and ten. Yeah. Just because I couldn't like see, you know, like I couldn't yeah, like, yeah. Deck with the other one. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, I, I thought about that. It might be good to have like the visual there. Um, so you can see you can see the the word distribution. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, I guess one one thing, and this was behind, I think one of the questions that I asked was, I was um, that the first time when you were going through the simulation with the the video responses from um, from Justin, it wasn't. Um, you you might want to do a bit more contextualizing there mm -hmm. um, yeah. in terms of what the user experience is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in in part, I think it was. I was hearing I was hearing your voice in audio, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But it wasn't in real time. Yeah. Okay. Right. So then I got confused about like what for a person who's actually going through that simulation, yeah. what are they inputting and how? Yeah. And yeah. then how are they experiencing the response? Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, I actually thought about that as I was doing like the people thinking how the people thinking that I'm talking um, in real time. Um, was it helpful to have that example? Like, do you think that is helpful? Should it be shorter? Um, I I appreciated that example. Yeah. Um, because in part because of, um, you know, showing showing people what the actual experience is going to yeah. look like for yeah. the teachers who are going through the simulation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why you know kind of fine tuning that so that it's um it's clearer what what that experience yeah. is mm -hmm. um i think would be would make it that much more effective yeah okay so that, that that's really helpful yeah I, I can definitely i can definitely do that um just as a point of clarity i was uh wanting to make sure i understood properly that um people can respond however way they want when they're in the simulation and those mm -hmm. two examples you give us at the beginning were just like common examples that represent yeah people. yeah yeah i think that that yeah that's true so there's sort of like th these were two responses that people gave and like kind of could give options um i could have it actually be like open-ended um i just wanted to sort of get the sense of like the the binary um but i could probably make that clear that these were like examples that people gave and that it's not like in the simulation you have to choose between these two um yeah, yeah i think that then to the documents that you're feeding into your model would be yeah helpful. yeah exactly um but yeah i think i think that i could make that clear that point a little bit clear clearer then now that i understand just to follow up on that one question i had was whether um after getting these results you sort of looked into some of the responses themselves to see whether the kind of, I think, convergence you were showing mm -hmm. with like a meaningful convergence or whether people might be using the same kinds of words, but in different ways based mm -hmm. on like, yeah. maybe the that's model. A, that's a good question. Um, that's actually not something that, that we've done. Um, I've, I've thought about it, but I haven't actually kind of like done a more, like, I think you would sort of need to do a kind of qualitative analysis to actually like look at like an individual person. Um, I think that that like it is very possible that it is people are picking up like terminology in the course and then using it in the simulations, which is not like a bad thing. Like it's, I think that's actually kind of what we want is like people to sort of like learn things and then apply it. But I think it, I think, and I hope this didn't come off as saying that, I'm not saying that now they're like, becoming more equitable and now they're actively in the course and they're like, you know, doing all of the equity practices. I think this is a longer term process. I think what we're showing is that people within the simulated concepts are being more cognizant of the type of issues that someone with already a, a high equity mindset would see in that type of simulation. Great. Thank you so much. And yeah. and uh, yeah. in order to not repeat last last week's explosion of my daughter into from the background, um, I will um, thank you and and thank everyone um, who joined us tonight. And thank you all for your questions and your feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and um, break a leg. Well, thank don't you. You. literally break yeah. a leg, but if you good have luck. any feedback. Though. <laughs> Please uh, feel free to get in, in, in touch with me. My email is jltobias at mit.edu. So any feedback is, is very welcome. Great. Right. Thank you. Bye.